Welcome to Tuesday Newsday, your number one resource for the entire week's worth of VR news. Finally, we got some good stuff to talk about, as even though consumer VR has been a little flat lately, VR research has been absolutely exploding. From cutting edge breakthroughs in ridiculously small form factor holographic displays to one of the most promising ultra wide VR prototypes I've seen yet, capable of up to 180 degrees field of view, to cutting edge hyper real VR headsets and yeah. even cat girl haptics. And on top of that, I got some of the biggest VR news, at least personally, that I have to announce. And I'll get to that at the end. But before all that, I recently found myself in a foreign country, hopping around from Wi-Fi to Wi-Fi, both to check in on our cat, but mostly to make sure that Deckard hasn't been announced yet. And throughout that entire trip, this video's sponsor, Surfshark VPN, legitimately made my entire life a whole lot easier. Not only was I at least a little more protected while using relatively sketchy Wi-Fi access points in random foreign countries by encrypting my internet traffic, which uh, still be careful with that, by the way, even with VPN. But also, if you're, say, in Italy, accessing the raw Italian internet, well, you're gonna be seeing the entire internet through an Italian lens, which is also why I constantly use a VPN while on the go, tunneling my internet traffic to make it appear like I was back in the States. You know, so I can get that wonderful US version of the web no matter where I'm at. But really, it's so I just don't get logged out of everything. Lately at home, I've just been self-hosting my own VPN, which is a wild thing to say in a Surfshark ad, but I'd say it's actually a really good thing because I know for a fact that Surfshark uses secure protocols and encryption. And even if I do self-host a VPN, I still use Surfshark all the time. And I can't overstate how awesome it is to just have a VPN like Surfshark easily available on any device you own anywhere in the world without any setup at all. You just download the client and connect. You don't have to do anything. And Surfshark has turned into a tool that I basically just always carry with me. And they're giving you guys a really good deal. If you head to Surfshark.com, com slash thrillseeker, you can get an extra four months of Surfshark for completely free with your plan. And so yeah, it's just a really good deal. Get that extra four months for free and start encrypting your internet traffic today. Like, uh, seriously. So thank you to Surfshark VPN for supporting the channel. But now let's just get right into the news. So this is something that I've been wanting to do for kind of a long time, but this news day just ended up being kind of perfect for it. This is a special research edition of Tuesday News Day, as while the past couple months of consumer VR have been and a little slow to say the least, under the surface, various virtual reality research projects have been absolutely popping off. And honestly, it's basically where all the cool stuff right now is happening in VR. So I just wanna jump right into some of the most interesting things that I found, but before we get to the big stuff, I'm gonna whet your appetite with this paper published in Science Advances. So over the past few years, I've talked about a few different ways to smell and taste virtual reality before, from the long since banned by the US government feel real vaporizer, to various gels, or diffusers, but this is by far the most interesting. This is what's called a gustatory interface, and right now it allows a user to actually taste the primary range of flavors. Sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. Unfortunately, there's no spicy yet, but it works using a system of micro pumps used to deliver an extremely precise mixture of specific molecules needed to replicate any taste within the supported range. Currently, the researchers have replicated chicken soup, lemonade, cake, and a fried egg. So I mean, you're not gonna be tasting a Taco Bell Chalupa with this anytime soon, but it's still pretty cool. And I think as you'll see as a running theme within this video, the researchers concluded that there's a long way to go here, but this method does work right now. And the research being done as some of the first of its kind is greatly broadening the entire field of remote sense stimulation. And we're truly not that far away from being able to taste very specific tastes in VR. It's really not a science fiction anymore. But I think most interestingly, this research is also serving as the establishing ground for this this upcoming industry's safety protocols when it comes to stimulating people's senses in this fashion, which is probably a really good idea. I mean, websites already stuff us with enough cookies as is. Just imagine getting served some sort of advertisement in VR alongside a tiny little dose of glucose to spike those neurons. Yeah, we should probably get far ahead of this one. But speaking of things that are either horrifying or incredible, depending on who you ask, researchers at the University of Tokyo, of course, have created a wearable device that simulates having cat ears, moving and reacting to sound 
headphones or other stimuli, including head pats, on your own head. Using a biometal fiber that's contained within this silicon tube, this fiber shrinks and bends, mimicking the inertial feeling of twitching or touched cat ears. So it's not just some flappy servo or vibrational haptic buzz, which we've seen before, but instead an actual tactile illusion of weight and motion shifting around on your scalp, which is both genius and incredibly cursed. And in case you're wondering who is this even for, it sounds a little random. In an adjacent study, I also found it interesting, but apparently 47% of all avatars in VR social apps that allow it at least are humanoids with animal ears, like cat ears. So yeah, that's exactly who this is for, about half of all VR social app users. Really, this study centers around a separate phenomenon called the Nekomimi illusion, which is essentially the sense of ownership over a virtual body part that you don't actually have. And this is something that I think deserves an entire full dive and video at a later time, but enough with the silly business. As just this past month, Meta, along with some other partners, have published three of the most interesting research papers that I've seen in years regarding VR, detailing a few specific massive advancements in virtual reality that I think just about everybody has been looking forward to. And I think these papers serve as a sort of pulse check on the entire industry, at least technology-wise. As when you put these papers together, it's pretty easy to see what virtual reality is going to look like over the next five to 15 years. And so I think the best one to start with is the one that's most likely to happen sooner, which is Meta's prototype for an extremely wide field of view VR headset. Something that already sort of exists today with various Pimax headsets and even the legendary Star VR 1 that I made a video about a couple years ago, but there's really truly never been something like this. For some context, for the past decade or so, the VR industry has been more or less stuck in the 100 to 110 degree field of view range. And while there have been devices that do have much wider field of view than 110, it usually comes at a huge cost in size, weight, and distortion, which is exactly where these two headsets are completely different, with both prototypes achieving near human field of view at 180 degrees horizontal and 120 degrees vertical. But there's also something else that's pretty special about this headset. Whereas most modern wide virtual reality devices might have large custom Fresnel or A-spheric lenses that warp the display's light directly into your eyes, usually resulting in a lot of distracting visual artifacts and, well, warping, this prototype uses something called high curvature polarized catadioptric optics, which is a uh, really just a fancy way of saying this is basically the next generation of super wide field of view pancake lenses. Yeah, these are just pancake lenses. And believe it or not, this is technically not a new idea. In fact, as I was looking into this research paper, I learned that this method of high field of view pancake optics for use in VR has been a thing for quite a while now, with this paper from 2017 outlining 3M's findings in curved folded optics. Now, obviously, Meta's prototype is quite a bit more advanced after years of research, and there's a lot more that's going on here. But once you know where this technology comes from, it's a little easier to see where it's actually going to go, as this quite literally is the next generation of pancake lenses, truly for the first time ever, enabling Quest 3 form factor with an extremely wide field of view. Now, whether this exact thing ever comes to a headset, eh, I doubt that we'll get anything this extreme, but I could absolutely see at least some of this technology making its way into whatever Meta's next Quest successor is. And I think it's pretty safe to say that if the field of view does go up in future headsets and pancake lenses are used, then this is probably exactly how they did it. However, as we move on to the next paper, I have to ask, what comes after pancake lenses? As our current pancakes get better and cheaper to manufacture, as we've already seen happen with the Quest 3, what's the next lens or display technology leap after pancakes and OLEDs? And oh boy, am I glad that you asked, because that's exactly what Meta's next paper is all about. Published about three days ago in collaboration with researchers from Stanford, this paper outlines a significant breakthrough in probably the most promising display technology for the next couple decades of VR devices. One that I have been so excited about. Synthetic Aperture Waveguide Holopathy, a technology that once mature enough to be shipped and not cost a truck's weight in kidneys, I believe will be the big turning point for VR, as it legitimately solves so many fundamental issues with the technology that we have today. But first, let me outline probably the biggest background issue with VR that nobody really talks about, mostly because it's a little boring and also because there's really nothing we can do about it right now. And that's a phenomenon called the Vergence Accommodation Conflict. And to put it simply, in physical reality, when you're looking around at things that have depth, your eyes naturally adjust their focus 
plane based on how far or close something is. In modern day VR, however, your eyes are locked at a single fixed focal distance for everything for the entire time you're using the device. Now to some people, this isn't that big of a deal and you can get used to it, but for everyone else, if you've ever left a VR session and had an inexplicable eye pain or even just a small headache, well, this is more than likely why. Your eyes are not meant to work this way. And on top of that, devices that are prone to the virgin's accommodation conflict, meaning all modern VR devices, can never fully represent a 3D image. While it might look 3D and it's about 60% of the way there using stereo overlap, it's just nowhere close to a true holographic display that utilizes depth cues. This right here is the number one reason why I'm so excited about these new waveguide displays. For years, Facebook has been showing off various varifocal lens systems and headsets. You may remember the old Half Dome that did exactly this, but every one of those prototypes has been in a far different, much more expensive and unwieldy way with more downsides. And I think it's pretty safe to say that waveguides are kind of the holy grail of both AR and VR. Now, the way this holographic display actually works is a little beyond the scope of this video, and I gotta be honest, it's beyond my pay grade as well. But from what I do understand, here's the gist. And if you're anything like me, it's a little mind blowing. So these waveguides do exactly what it sounds like. They guide RGB laser light that's injected into the side of the optic that is guided using what's called a MEMS steerable mirror, which is another absolutely insane rabbit hole. A MEMS mirror is basically a microscopic mechanical mirror on a chip that can angle light with extreme precision, which is insane. But back to the waves. The mirror scans a laser beam across specific angles of the waveguide, which then comes back to form the image after passing through specific specific microscopic gratings to direct that hologram into your eye. But that's not the only breakthrough here, as that's already kind of existed. The truly crazy thing here is that this is also one of the clearest and most vibrant waveguides of its type ever made, and it's mostly because it was actually co-designed with AI-driven holography. Now, predicting how light is going to behave inside of the waveguide, especially one this thin, is quite the messy problem to say the least. You can see what the result actually looks like, and it's it's not too pretty. So the researchers trained an AI model to understand exactly that. The model then learns to generate the correct holographic phase patterns to form an accurate holographic image, resulting in significant improvements. And so when you put this all together, you can see how this essentially solves one of the largest fundamental issues with VR hardware, at least visually, as this is a true 3D holographic image. It's not just a display that you're looking at through lens, enabling true depth, no virgin's accommodation conflict, and high contrast. While while also solving another massive issue. All of this is done in the smallest form factor that is really possible on a physics level, which is orders of magnitude smaller than anything on the market. And to be real, this is basically the only technology that's going to truly enable actual real glasses form factor VR, which is what multiple people at Meta have said their end goal is. Not to mention there's obviously this giant like trillion dollar race for AR glasses, which this works for that too. Now, this exact unit is very far from making it into an actual device that you can buy. I mean, not only would this be expensive to say the least, but uh, as promising as this all sounds, it's not entirely usable with only 38 degrees field of view. FOV was clearly not a focus of the study, more so just getting the actual system working. So yeah, we got a long way to go. But still, I don't think I can understate how incredibly cool it is to witness an entirely new, legit groundbreaking display technology evolve right in front of our eyes for our niche. Like this is for us guys. Movie buff have gotten big screen TVs, we get this. And hopefully, at least within the next at least 10 years, we'll be able to watch this technology evolve literally in front of our eyes. Like I said, a lot's been going on. All this stuff was just published in the past couple months, and there's another one that I want to talk about in a future news day as it's actually not published yet, but it has to do with hyper real VR. We're talking about 90 pixels per degree, 1400 nits to the eye. Meta says themselves that it's just about the most realistic VR out there, so I'll have to wait for that paper. But again, I wanted to address how consumer VR has been just a little rough lately. Like nothing bad, just kind of nothing's been going on. And I wanted to rebuttal that with saying, I don't think VR is in a bad spot necessarily. I just say that the industry right now is truly just finding itself. It's a little lost and a bit directionless maybe, but I feel like it's only a matter of time before the entire industry regains its confidence and comes back for a second wind. Or is it the 30th wind at this point? I don't know. Which is why I'm so excited for all this research. The industry is experimenting quite literally. And I think it'll be better for it. But I saved the biggest news for last, at least the biggest personal VR news, probably 
that I've ever talked about. As a lot has been going on for myself and the channel, and I figured I'd just give you guys an update. So in case you guys didn't know, Fia from the virtual reality show, you might know her. We've been dating for about the past four years now. And over that time, we've shared so many memories and had endless conversations about VR. We've hosted events together. We've done a few videos on her channel together as well. And also more often than not, if you're ever watching one of my videos and you see me in the shot and there's a camera that's moving, well, she's probably the one that's behind the camera. She's been an immense help and just an awesome partner. And well, I just wanted to say that as of a couple months ago, Fia is, is now my ex-girlfriend. That's because we're now fiance. Yeah, we went on a little trip and uh, yeah. So this uh, kind of marks a big change, both in my personal life and for the channel as a lot is going on right now. Like I can't believe how many things in my life are just changing all at once. We're in the middle of moving to a totally new studio. So I'm excited to show you guys that. I've been working on a brand new series that I've been excited about for no joke a couple years, but I finally am pulling the trigger on it. And I've got a bit of a backlog of videos that I need to take care of. So. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I'm excited for the future. There's a ton of work to be done and there's some fights to be had and not everything's perfect, but I'm excited. And so again, this is kind of an intense amount of change all happening at once, moving, fiance, videos. I also ditched Adobe entirely. Welcome to the first video edit on this channel entirely on DaVinci, <laughs> Adobe. And I also switched to Linux for most things. Yeah, basically everything in my life has kind of been changing lately, but I'm happy for it. And for the first time in a while, I'm actually excited to make videos and talk about VR again. Anyways, make sure to leave a question of the week down below. I read every single comment and I try to answer as many as I possibly can. But also thank you so much to all my supporters on Patreon. I couldn't do any of this without you. And I got some cool stuff coming to Patreon pretty soon. And like always, don't forget to like this video if you loved it, subscribe if you want more of this and hit that freaking bell if you just can't live without it. Much love, thrill out.